And for once, we're actually live, and it's not a holiday that I forgot about, uh, and it's not completely published at the wrong time. So already, we're doing really well uh, here. <laughs> Um, our, uh, our special guests today are, uh, John Sparks, who is one of the leaders in our electrical and, uh, and controls team. Uh, we have yeah. Phil Barr, who is our, uh, a technical name is electrical projects executive, but he's a, a state licensed, um, electrical, uh, contractor and, um, one in our, essentially our team lead on our electrical team here at Kalos. Uh, and then we have Matthew Taylor, who a lot of you have already met. Matthew is our director of um, commercial refrigeration service, uh, specifically uh, mostly focused on the market refrigeration side of things, where and we have a lot of three phase. So um, one of the things that uh, I want to kind of just tee up here, what we're talking about is for people who have worked with a lot of single phase. And they're uh, uncomfortable with three phase or they feel like they don't understand it. That's what we're doing today is we're kind of unpacking some of those things that maybe are hard for folks to understand when they make that transition. And one of the really nice things about this group is I think all of us to one degree or another have made that transition or had to make that transition at times. Uh, and there's all and we're going to just kind of talk through the things that we find um, find confusing or challenging about it. Uh, and I'm just going to like totally set people up with questions and uh, and go from there. We did realize this slide here is uh, is not the right one. So we're just not going to even show that one. Uh, that happens sometimes. So let's start here. And I, and I want to just kind of I'm going to ask this of you first, Phil. So I'm going to put you on the spot Okay. Um, for people who are like completely like, OK, well, three phase power coming into my house. I mean, single phase power coming to my house and three phase power coming in, into a building. What makes those different? Where do we where do we start to try to understand this concept? Well, the uh, one of the first things um, you might notice is you 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 still have 120 volts to neutral or 120 volts to ground, so you'd be familiar with familiar with that between your A and B phase, but you have a third phase. Um, so now instead of a three wire system, you're installing a four wire system as your service in order to bring in that extra phase. But now you also uh, instead of 240 volts to ground and or neutral, you have 208 volts to ground. That would probably be the one of the first. Uh, apparent differences most noticeable difference and then of course you, you know there's the other like getting into the technical side of why you have 208 to ground versus 240 you know starts to get into some more technical stuff um yeah so let's go let's let's show a couple different slides here because i think one of the first things um and it's a bummer that roman's not here because he loves to talk about oscilloscopes it's like his favorite topic in the whole world is oscilloscopes <laughs> um but uh, just kind of understanding what we're looking at here um so one of the ways that i like to start is imagine that essentially all of the distribution power that we see is generated by a rotating magnetic field, right? So we have we have these generators uh, at a power plant somewhere, and you're and you're spinning something. You're spinning magnets uh, within a within a you know a set of coils, and you're creating this uh, analog signal, this up and down analog signal. And when we're dealing with single phase, we're only taking one of those three phases that are produced by the power company, and that's what we're using uh, at our structure. And so um, who wants to take this? Because I think this is one of the first things people don't understand. Uh, and one of the first things I want to talk about, this idea of when we say single phase power at a structure, but we say, well, but we have two phases. Well, how is it single phase power? We have two. We have two uh, opposing <clears throat> 120 volt phases. Um, why is that not true? Why is it actually really, truly single phase power? Who wants to take that one? I mean, I can Go take ahead. that. Go ahead, John. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's really kind of a misleading name. I think the we should really start to call it split phase because that's really what we're doing is, you know, out of those three phases that are produced from the power company, we're taking one of those and we're installing them in a split phase transformer. And what it does is while it steps it down, it the windings in that transformer go one direction and then a different direction, creating a split phase, two completely different phases. It being and, and really and again, like kind of like what you mentioned, if you took away that center tap neutral. So if you look at this, I really like this illustration because it shows the same thing two different ways. If you remove that center tap neutral and you were to look at this on an oscilloscope uh, from one side of hot to the other side of hot, you would just see one 240 volt sine wave. Mm -hmm. The reason why if we were to look at split phase power and we reference it to neutral, 
the reason why you see two completely opposing sine waves, and unfortunately I don't have a 240 volt sign shown here, um, is because of just how you connect the oscilloscope. But it's because we're we're referencing to that neutral. And the easy way to think about it is, if you look at it from the perspective of the neutral, if you imagine you're looking right down that neutral, and now you're looking both ways, one of those uh, windings is going one way and one is going the other way. So when you're looking at it from the perspective of neutral as your reference, again, when we're using a voltmeter, we're always going between two points, right? So when you're going from neutral to one side, now that sine wave looks like it's half as tall and opposite of the other side. Because if you start from the center, those coils go opposite directions from each other, right? But the reality is, is it's still just a step down transformer. It's literally, in this case, we show it here, a 7200 volt to 240 volt step down step down transformer and it is has a center tapped secondary neutral and that's the reason why we see two different phases it only starts with one power company phase though yeah the power company phase too the if you look at it from the primary perspective too you're coming in with hot and you're leaving your power comes in hot and leaves on the neutral back to the power company it doesn't leave on another phase um, on that on this particular setup um it, that makes it really easy to, to look at and say from the power company perspective well how many phases are you supplying me with one i'm feeding one phase and i'm returning back on neutral because you don't bring a neutral in well on uh three phase you wouldn't bring a neutral in but yeah and so let, let's talk about that quickly I, just because you mentioned that talk about this idea of i'm going to pull back up our um we'll pull back up our our y configuration so it doesn't say this here but this is a y configured three-phase system we're diving right in here those um why do they call it that yeah why did they call it that yeah somebody says we have no sound but i don't think that's true because other people can clearly hear us um so uh so ask questions as we go along but uh, but talk about um, this idea of phase balancing because this is a really big factor in three phase and we don't really talk about it as much on single phase so talk about that a little bit phil and try to try to keep it as simple of an explanation as you can <laughs> Um, well, I would, I usually think of phase balancing from the perspective of what's returning on the neutral. Um, so if your phases are balanced, if, if you have 10 amps on A, B and C, then you'll end up with zero amps returning on neutral. Um, whereas because if you have an, each other out, because they balance each other out, you know, this has to do with, um, I believe it has to do with the inductive reactant returning, but no, that's not quite right. Let me not try to get into that, but yeah, it's just sort of mathematical. It's just how it works. Like, well, just believe me. It's how it works. <laughs> just like believe us. us. Yeah. Just well, believe us. Just believe us. Yeah. What goes out, you know, must come back. But, uh, but, you know, and when you're, when you're, when you have your neutral hooked up as it is, and if you had equal current, like I said, on each phase, you'd have zero going back. Whereas if you had five amps, I'm not going to do the math, but if you had five amps on C, and 10 on B and 20 on A, you'll get the aggregate imbalance of that returning on the neutral. Um, and that's true when you have um, single phase um, uh, devices connected in three phase power. This is kind of what we're trying mm -hmm. to get across here. Um, when you connect this, any sort of three phase system to a three phase motor or a three phase device, well, then you're going to have the same current on all three phases, or at least you should. Um, it would be a problem if you didn't. So you're going to have the same current on all three phases, and it's going to be naturally balanced. But when you're connecting from phase to neutral, that's where uh, you can have imbalance. And that's where, for those of you who, I want to talk about this quickly, again, just kind of, we're just kind of setting some ground, some ground stuff here, some common things that people talk about. Um, one, of the, one of the common confusions is, or one of the things that people have a really hard time understanding when you see this, is why between phases do you have 120 volts, just like you would in single phase or split phase, like John said, and why do you have 208 instead of 240? Why isn't it double? Um, and the reason that is, is shown here, because these phases are not directly 180 degrees out of phase from each other. You see the peaks and the valleys are a little bit offset. And so you don't get that full kind of peak to peak value that you get in split phase when by its very nature, because you're splitting it from the center, your center referencing that secondary. Um, you don't have that now because you're working with two phases. And so even though to neutral, you have 120 volts, which would be the same as if it was single phase, because it is at that point to neutral, it is single phase in that case. From phase to phase, you don't have as much differential um, between those uh, between those sine waves. 
Did I say that okay, Phil? Yeah. Something interesting about that. I don't know if maybe this is for a later time in the podcast. Um, you might think that because your voltage is not peaking so you, at the same time, so you don't have 240 volts, you might think you'll get more power delivery out of a single phase system. But you'll get something like, I looked it up earlier, it's like 73.2% more power delivery out of a three phase system, even though it's 208 volt. Because at no point do you have any of your volt, your voltage is never at zero. Correct. At any point. So and that's depending on what you're driving, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, if 120 low volts, you know, of course, you're still going to hit zero on 120 volt loads. But if you're using the three phase power, you're never going to have zero voltage at any time. Right. There's not as many peaks and bounds. It's all pretty consistent. Well, it's more so because, again, you just don't have you don't have that exact where they're valuing that va valuing at the exact same moment. For th mm -hmm. So for things like driving motors, there's actually a value that sort of exceeds the true RMS value, which we're not going to get into that, but that's, it's a kind of an interesting, interesting thing there. And that's, this is like engineering level stuff. Um, so I want to kind of, I want to kind of back up and um, cause Matthew, you have worked in a lot of different uh, parts of the trade. Um, and for, so for guys who, and you've trained a lot of guys who really uh, came up on single phase and then start to have practical problems when they work on three phase, what are some of those kind of practical challenges that they face? Yeah, sure. So one of the big ones is, um, you know, if we have a problem with a leg, you know, we drop a leg, uh, that type of thing can happen, particularly, you know, not talking about this as an electrician, but, but as a refrigeration tech, right? You've got a contactor that's pulling in and that's turning on a compressor. Well, you guys know we wear out contactors in the residential world. We may have a, a, a single pole that's actually moving on a contact. That's fairly common in a residential AC system, for instance. So, so a technician is not going to be used to burning one of the three up. Right. And that happens. Uh, so then we single phase and, uh, and that can be really confusing uh, because I'm going to get a higher amp draw uh, because I'm no, I'm trying to do the same amount of work, the same watt, Right. Uh, but I'm going to split that onto two wires instead of three, uh, you know, I'll set my amps take off. Uh, so, uh, so I'm seeing that as a, as a mechanical problem with this device, uh, when in fact, it's just not getting three legs of power, right. And it can in fact burn it up and, and will over, you know, fairly short period of time as well. So, so that's one of the largest things that you just gotta, you gotta understand and you gotta check for it. Uh, when you check your amps, you gotta check all three legs. And if one of them zero, you need to be shutting that down. Uh, real fast uh, and it'll let you know that you didn't buy the smoke that will start coming out of it uh, and the fire. Uh, so uh, do that preemptively. Uh, so, so that's, that's one of the big challenges. Uh, one of the, the things I want to add there, one of the things I want to add there quickly is that this is a, a huge change because in single phase in a single phase mindset, it's like, Hey, if the points on my contactor or anything sort of in that, in that start gear, if something goes wrong, what's the worst that's going to happen? It's not going to run. Right. But anytime right. you start working in three phase equipment, the worst that's going to happen is you're going to burn the freaking motor out. And so you really do have to pay attention. If you start to get uh, contactor wear, point wear, that kind of stuff, you want to be more proactive about preventing those problems because it can really cause uh, major issues. Anyway, keep going. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just, you know, driving that point home as a preventative, one of the things that we're constantly doing is checking uh, across that contactor when it's pulled in uh, with a really good meter to see, you know, how many volts across that do I have? And it should be less than a half. And, you know, when I start to get up to a volt, let's just change that contactor. Like you said, it's not because it's not going to run. It's because it's going to, it's going to destroy that $7,000, $14,000 compressor. Yep. Uh, so that's, you know, that, that's one of those challenges. Uh, and another is uh, that really stumps guys is figuring out uh, the, wattage or or you know the amount of power that i'm going to consume uh when i'm looking at that you know that simple formula i know we don't want to get very technical here but that that real simple formula of you know our work is equal to our volts times our amps right uh, and when we do that math with three phase power we're missing the square root of three uh, and it's the math doesn't work if we don't use that uh so that's probably you know another one of those areas that just trips guys up they get a different amp reading than they expected uh or they've you know even worse they've sized things incorrectly you know they thought well i had some number eight on my truck i thought it'd be all right uh and now all of a sudden you know my amps are, are something different than i expected uh 
you know, you know, because I'm running a 25 horse motor, it's going to run 25 no matter what. Right. Uh, so, so that's, that's one of those challenges too, that can, you know, just take a minute to wrap your head around it. Uh, now I, I know we started with this graph and I like this graph for a minute. If you don't mind, I'd like to, this isn't your question, but I want to talk about it for just for a minute. Uh, we're, we're talking as if everybody listening understands that we're talking about AC voltage here, alternating current. Uh, and when we're looking at that single phase, uh, drawing over there, that's one hurt, right? And that's, that's the speed that that happens, that we go from our maximum voltage to our minimum voltage and, and cross through that zero, basically the third time. Uh, that's, that's a hurt. Uh, so just keeping that clear when we're talking about three phase power, it's the exact same cycle. It's just offset. So it's still happening the same, same time pattern three times. Uh, and they're just not all happening as one, uh, they're, they're offset. And that's where our 120 degrees or whatnot is coming from. And that's, that's generally because as Brian started talking about when we're generating this power in the power plant, we're doing that with a physical device. Well, that device typically has arms, uh, and it looks like our Y kind of, right. Uh, and it's got coils wrapped around it. Well, they're 120 degrees apart. Physically, if you took a compass and measured, it'd be 120 degrees. So that's why we get the phase, the, that stagger that we get on, on the three phases. Just want to yeah, clarify that for a minute. Yeah, for sure. And another thing that I want to mention here quickly, because a lot of people be like, all right, well, what's the benefit? Well, for anyone who's, uh, you know, seen one of these bad boys before, um, you know that in order for us to drive single phase motors, the vast majority <laughs> of single phase motors, we have to essentially create an artificial um, third leg. And we do that with capacitors. So there's various types of capacitors that you can do this with. We're showing a run capacitor here. And that's what you're doing with a run capacitor. A run capacitor is storing and releasing current. Um, the amount of current that it can store and release is dictated by the microfarads, but it creates a phase shift. And so that combination of essentially you're creating another third leg, you're creating an auxiliary leg that helps spin that motor. And I always use the example of a pinwheel. Uh, and then I realized that kids today don't know what a pinwheel is. So that's that's kind of uh, disappointing. But if you're trying to spin a pinwheel, if you imagine you're holding a pinwheel in front of you and you're trying to spin it with your hands and you're just taking it and slapping it on the sides back and forth, it's not going to spin very well. Right. Uh, whereas if you had three hands and you could kind of spin it and hit it like this all mm -hmm. in perfect timing, that pinwheel would spin not only would it spin uh, with good torque and with consistent torque, but it would also spin in the right direction consistently. And you know, those of you who know, if you ever have a motor like a uh, condenser fan motor that doesn't have a lot of torque on it and you have a failed capacitor, a lot of times that motor will run backwards on you. Uh, and that's the reason is that without having that sort of artificially created third leg that we use a capacitor for, that motor won't start in the right direction. It doesn't have torque. It's like slapping a pinwheel on the sides of it without having another little hand that kind of kind of hits it in the right direction. And that's that's basically how I often describe a capacitor uh, in single phase is it's like another little hand that helps hit that motor and get it with torque moving in the right direction. But with three phase, we automatically have that built in. So especially for dealing with motors, which is really what three phase shines in, when you're going to drive an electromagnet, an inductive load, uh, three phase is superior uh, because you just you don't need Definitely. all these extra componentry, um, but it does have some of these other challenges. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention that kind of ties in with what you were talking about, Matthew, is this idea of phase monitoring. Um, phase monitoring becomes really, really important in uh, three phase applications because, like you said, if you lose a phase or if you start to get phase imbalance where the voltages aren't the same, the currents aren't the same, that can be really, really damaging to motors. Another another kind of quick caveat I want to make, just because I this is like my favorite topic and I talk about it all the time and it's one of the things I've done the most testing on and I'm super nerdy about, is this idea of um, what happens when you do have incorrect voltages or when you do get imbalances or when you lose a phase. What happens a lot of times um, is that you may get an increase in current, you may sometimes get a decrease, depends on the motor, depends on if it's driven by a VFD, what the situation is. But what happens is, is you produce a lot more heat. And our goal is to take all of that uh, energy that we're providing electrically. And as much of it as we can, we want to turn it into uh, actual kinetic motion. We want to turn it into uh, magnetic fields that are moving things around. And when you start to get any imbalance or you start to get, and we have a calculator uh, on the HVAC school app that'll show you the amount of heat increase that you get depending on phase imbalance and all that. Um, but when you, when you get anything that's incorrect there, it increases heat. So even if you don't lose a leg completely, but like Matthew said, if you're getting voltage drop across a contactor. And literally we're saying, take your voltmeter and put it across the contacts, not from leg to leg, but literally across the contacts. 
because those should be the well, same point. While it's energized. Yeah. While it's energized, while it's running, right? It has to be operational. And you should not see essentially any voltage drop across that. If you see anything, you said half a volt, but really almost anything that's consistently measurable is an indication of, of a challenge. Um, but something, something's not quite right. Uh, and that's something to always watch for, as well as doing visual inspections. Somebody mentioned, and I wanted to just kind of bring that up again because it's a really good point. Um, it's also a good opportunity uh, in three phase to start using infrared on um, contactors, breakers, uh, wire connections, all those sorts of things to find anything that could be weak. Because in three phase, it just does make more of a difference. Uh, and not only that, but also the equipment tends to be more expensive, right? So, yeah, so having something fail is also a much bigger deal in a lot of cases. Hmm. Yeah, that's, um, um, good, Phil. I lost, completely lost my thought. So no. <laughs> it was a really good point, I'm sure, is yep. what you wanted to it say. It was a very good point, yeah. yeah. And it was probably well said. Oh, no, it was I about lo the load balancing, because uh, earlier you asked the question, and usually I would think about that in, in terms of referencing the neutral and making sure it got balanced. But that's a, that's actually a bigger and more important reason, especially buildings that do have motors, because like we're, you know, as electricians, we're not just wiring the AC equipment, we're wiring outlets and lights, the whole building. If we wire the whole building without considering uh, that load balance, then we're going to have more voltage drop on A phase versus C phase and so on. And that's in turn going to affect all of these motor loads as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And if you haven't seen it, um, uh, your, uh, somebody you may know did make a good app that, that will do all that math exactly for you. Like I just mentioned. So it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty neat. Oh, wow. That guy's pretty yeah. good. I mean, I don't know. I hear good things about him sometimes. Him. <laughs> Not from his kids um, or the dog, but from, you know, other people. Anyway, so uh, I want to talk. I want to uh, actually I want to go back here real quick and just make sure we're hitting all these. Oh, no, I had the points up on a slide and that slide disappeared, too. Oh, yeah. Huh? I wonder wow. who got rid of that slide. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, let's talk about Delta. So this is an opportunity for either John or Phil. Uh, to talk a little bit about, about Delta and Wild Lake. We had a bunch of people who uh, who uh, wanted to uh, talk about that. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I can summarize it. Uh, the biggest difference between Delta and a Y configuration, um, first of all, uh, the reasons you would want to go for a Delta is because you have a greater voltage from phase to phase. It's no longer a 208 to 208. It is a 240 to 240. But because of the way that the configuration has to happen for that to go is on um, on one leg, you're going to end up getting 208 from phase to neutral or phase to ground. Yeah, and this actually shows it pretty well. So um, right. uh, those of you who are like super overwhelmed by this, I'm like, I don't know what the heck he's talking about. Just breathe, breathe for a second. OK, so we're going to show you here. You always have neutral connected somewhere on the transformer. Mm -hmm. you, you do. In every case, you do in, sorry, not that one, you do in residential. See here, this is your, uh, on the full right side here, this is the secondary goes to your house. You do in, in your Y configuration, and, and it's center tapped. You do even in, um, like, at your 24-volt transformer, but the vast majority of 24-volt transformers that you work on, um, they are corner, uh, they have a corner tapped ground which means that, and you'll see this sometimes, where you'll actually see where connected to the blue side or the common side of your transformer, sometimes it'll literally go and you'll physically see it uh, being referenced to ground, like it will actually connect somewhere to ground. And it's just where are you connecting that ground slash neutral mm -hmm. within this transformer configuration? And that makes a big difference. A lot of people will say, you know, did you ground uh, did you, uh, did you ground the secondary of your transformer? Right. They'll, they'll, they'll say it that way, but really what you're doing is you're, you're setting a reference for ground and neutral in relationship to this transformer. The transformer doesn't need to be grounded or neutraled at all. It will work just fine if it has no ground or neutral, but that creates safety issues. Uh, and it also makes testing really difficult. Uh, and so in this case with a Y situation, we're, we're right in the center. So all three legs are going to be exactly the same to that center. But when you look at Delta, uh, it's not the same, right? It's it's in the center between two of the phases, and mm -hmm. one of the phases is much further away, right? So, so uh, between that wild leg and neutral or ground, you're just going to have higher voltage, and that's super important um, if you're going to start connecting lighting or uh, appliances or anything to it. You have to know that you've got that wild leg, or you're going to burn up your your vacuum pump. 
your uh, your shop vac, whatever you connect to it, if you do that incorrectly. It but should another... be identified as orange, if, right? Your, your, and your always system. on always on B phase. As yeah, well. Even if it's one twenty two oh eight, Amer you know, National Electrical Code requires that we do identify that as orange and mm -hmm. being on the B phase. The most many utility companies, however, will ask you to land your high leg on the farthest right terminal in your meter. And so that can be a little confusing because you'll, you know, you'll have your high leg on what looks like C phase in your meter, but then you have to transition it to B phase to when you actually land it in your load centers, disconnect switches in order to comply with code. Yeah. And one of the things that, cause somebody brought it up um, and the way he put it is I've seen a grounded leg Delta um, deltas aren't all this way. This is your, this is, and I don't know what the technical name is for this. We would call it a wild leg delta. This is by far the most common that you see. Um, but there are cases where there will co corner ground uh, the delta, or you'll have ungrounded deltas in some cases too. So all of that's going to be, uh, it's going to vary on what you see. Um, and that's where just understanding how to use your meter. If you're getting to this point, you probably should be an electrician um, anyway. Like you, you probably shouldn't um, be messing around with it too much, but just understanding that this exists. You uh, likely to sense. mostly only see this in industrial settings. This isn't all that valuable for anything other than industrial settings where they care mostly about their motor loads. You're going to see mostly a Y configuration in commercial settings because we need a pretty equal balance of motor loads to general purpose lighting and, and outlet loads. I'm going to go into um, old man story here, which is there's a uh, there's a a physical therapy office in uh, downtown Claremont that has this in it. Uh, and uh, in a lot of cases, you're going to see that, you know, like this isn't this being 240 is also kind of odd. A lot of cases you'd see this in 48, you know, like is this all, we're just using a single set of voltages here. There's a lot of different varieties. Right. Um, but this particular uh, office was exactly what we have here. And what interesting thing that happened is that because remember, leg to leg, it's the same. Right. And so we connected up a, um, a ductless unit. Uh, a, a mini split to it. And one of the legs that we used was the wild leg. Now in a mini split, you don't need a neutral anyway, right? So the voltage was correct. Measured with the mm -hmm. meter was correct, but we were getting massive board failure on it all the time. Board failure. We couldn't find anything else wrong with it. Anybody have any theories? Sorry, I, I should, I should just tell you why, but, uh, but anybody have any theories? Board. Yeah, because one of the, the leg that was the high leg was the one that stepped down to power up the board. So the voltage was increasingly higher. Well, it wasn't even that. It was that everything. So if you've ever looked inside of a ductless system, your tolerances on everything are super, super close tolerances. Mm -hmm. And so it was designed for phase to ground voltages to be lower phase to ground voltages. And now we had a much higher phase to ground voltage. So your arc potential is much greater, right? Because now there is still greater potential from that wild leg to all of the grounded components that are all sitting around the board mm -hmm. and everything that's connected. Now, again, that's my theory. There could be other reasons that I'm not factoring in. But as soon as we moved away from that wild leg, even though we had the correct voltage applied, uh, we were still having still having failures there. So hmm. anybody think I'm okay. crazy? No, I don't actually. No. Well, I am. So, well. It seems like a good enough explanation to me. Okay. Well, it's, I made it up. So it's, uh, it's fair, <laughs> enough, fair enough. Who's going to prove you wrong anyway? All right. That's a good point, right? That's the thing about these old man stories is it's like, well, I was there and I'm telling you, that's what it was. <laughs> I'll go right? there tomorrow if it means I can prove you wrong. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. What else do we want to cover here? Because I don't have my list. Matt, do you have that list up of the different topics we're going to cover here? Nothing um, like dead air on a podcast. VFD conversion. Oh yeah, single to three phase. Yeah, let's talk about that quickly. Let's talk about um about that. Um, so this is a VFD. It's not quite the type of VFD that we're talking about here. Um, but you can talk about that a little bit, Matthew. Um, about that, uh, the concept of converting single phases. <laughs> yeah, like because you know that I can talk about VFDs for a couple hours, right? Uh -huh, right. Um, all right. So trying to stay away from the real major application of VFDs and getting into all that, the three phase is a place we can also use a VFD. Inverter and VFD, same same thing, different names. Right? But what we're doing here, uh, just the general idea is we're bringing AC power into this thing. We're going to rectify it and we're going to change it to DC. 
Now, my drive has the ability to recreate AC voltage. It's not real AC. It's actually little steps of DC voltage. Uh, there it is. There's our picture. Uh, in, in my world, that 480 seems like home. Uh, so it's going to create uh, that that DC voltage that looks like AC. It's going to put out one volt, two volts, three volts, four volts, right? And it's going to do that. If we want it to do that in 60 hertz, it'll do that in one hertz. It'll go through the whole thing, give us the positive and the negative, and it will react in the motor just like AC, right? It doesn't know the difference. Uh, and, and we just manipulate that hertz to speed up and slow down our motor. That's how we don't overamp and burn things out, right? But the other thing we can do is because we're creating this artificial AC voltage, we can create three legs. There's no reason we can't because we're making it. The computer is generating it, right? So we can bring in single phase power uh, as long as we've got that energy source uh, and our VFD can then create our, our DC voltage that looks like three phase ac to that motor it won't know the difference now when we do that there there's there's a couple key components that we got to be very careful of we're gonna use the same wattage we're gonna use the same amps or i'm sorry the same power we're gonna use the same horsepower right so if it's a 25 horse motor it's a 25 horse motor when we're sizing that the wires to that vfd we're gonna use the rules uh, of three phase power. We're going to use the square root of, of three uh, and our wires are, are going to have less current on them than the, than the single phase that's feeding the VFD. It's going to carry that same horsepower on two wires instead of three, right? So their amps are going to be higher. That breaker has got to be larger and the wiring, you know, the wire feeding that VFD is going to actually be larger than what runs the motor. Uh, but that is a, a place not, not highly used. It's not super efficient and it's definitely not cost effective. If you have three phase power, you, you would not do this uh, in that situation. But if you have a situation where three phase power is just not possible and I have a device that can only be three phase, this is the way around that. Uh, and for all you guys that are watching this, you're thinking, where would I use that? In your garage when you're trying to use that <laughs> piece of commercial equipment you picked up, right? Uh, that's a common place for this. And in, in, in the place that I've used it, uh, you know, I do a little work with uh, with the Rosebud Continuum. They they had a donation of a very expensive piece of equipment that was three phase uh, to grind plastic. They're trying to recycle that and, and create other materials out of it. And, and you know, it's $25,000 piece of equipment. Somebody just gave them. So how are we going to run that? Well, we ran through a VFD. Interesting. I've actually never heard of it being used that way. I always heard, heard y'all use a VFD to make three phase power, but I've never applied it. You, your explanation is great. So it's like, okay, yes, I have single phase power, but the computer knows the timing that it needs to set that those other two phases do. So it just programmatically creates the other two phases yeah that's it that's it in a nutshell and, and typically when we do that of course we're going to run our vfd at quote full speed at 60 hertz because that's what what we typically can do but there's no reason we can't use it as a real vfd and actually have a soft start and you know run it at half speed if we want 30 hertz you know whatever it has that capability we're just probably not using it for that if we're in that application I'm just trying to create that three phase power mm-hmm you probably will still, and I don't know this for a fact, but I would imagine that you will still have some of the issues that you get when you use VFDs with traditional motors uh, for speed control is that you would probably get some of that um, bearing wear, uh, some of that kind of uh, shaft grounding challenges, uh, I would imagine. So it's probably something. Yeah, there. You're, you're definitely going to want to quote armor it, uh, right? Just like you would if you were adding a VFD to a conventional system. You know, the most common thing that's done there is a grounding ring, you know, a ring that goes on the shaft. that has got little metal hairs that hang out and ground the body to that shaft while it's spinning. That takes that arcing out that occurs through the bearing. All right. It no longer happens through the bearing. It goes around the bearing through those little hairs uh, and, you know, little whiskers uh, that are just touching enough to not create drag, but to, to allow it to discharge. Uh, it's, and the other thing that tends to happen, uh, VFDs, when we, when we add a VFD to a, you know, a non VFD system, uh, we've got to be really careful with the condition of our wire. And often we do this outside, you know, where that wire is exposed to some light 
uh, and it'd be regular jhn or something like that that really doesn't care it's it's strapped inside the the condenser you know so nobody really even sees it well that stuff is insulated well enough that you can run your fingers up and down it you know it's 483 phase power it won't hurt you uh but once i start causing this vfd phenomena uh it starts finding those little tiny breakdown in that insulation and starts arcing through uh and, and we'll see a very high failure uh in motors and uh in wiring uh once we once we apply that so if any anytime you want to use something like this you're going to want to uprate your wiring for sure and at least go with fresh uh, and then the other piece is you're going to want some kind of protection that uh, is available, but for cost reasons, probably isn't being used on your non-VFD systems. And I'm talking about like a motor starter overload type uh, protection that's really just not used very often on condensing fan motors, for instance. Uh, if I got a three horse condensing fan motor, you know, I got eight of them in this condenser. Uh, they just got contactors that slam in and out. Um, phase protection, you know, we do have phase protection on the whole system, but that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, some fuses in there. Uh, if I add a VFD to that system, uh, I'll know my, I've got a problem with one of those wires arcing a little bit because my motor is going to burn. You know, once again, you know, smoke's going to come out, right? Uh, and it's done. So I'm probably going to want to put uh, an overload or a starter uh, on that so that it trips before that happens. And when I go to reset it and I reset it and it starts up and it runs just fine and I leave and say, see you tomorrow, which is really bad practice, that burning will get worse and worse until it actually yeah. you know, fails the motor. So that's my sign when that trips and, and I can't find any problem, that's my warning sign. I've got a wiring, you know, I've got something shorting uh, in the wire. Arcing, yeah. I guess not really shorting, arcing would be a better term. Yeah, one of the terms uh, that Matthew used that is kind of foreign to a more residential single phase technician is this term a starter. And a starter is really like a big contactor that has an overload built into it. I mean, that's that's really what it is. Uh, and there's a lot of different qualities, a lot of different types, um, but that's essentially what it is. And we're so used to, well, look, our overload protection is intrinsic to our motor, right? Well, for the reasons that Matthew just stated, uh, it's a good idea, but even sometimes some motors don't have overload protection built into them, and that's where you—that's where a, uh, a starter comes in. So I always just like to redefine some terms that may be foreign to. Uh, yeah, th thank you. I, it, it just slipped my mind completely that that you know that device is not very common in uh, in non three yeah. phase in the three phase world. So the other thing about it versus the one that's in the motor is it's adjustable and it's far more sensitive. Uh, it's also far more expensive. You know, <laughs> don't don't think this is a freebie uh but we can dial that in and it's got a little dial on it that will let you look at the service factor of that motor what is your actual voltage that i've got coming in uh and calculate that very precisely set it just slightly higher as, as you know i don't want nuisance trips but at the same time i want it's got a purpose i want it to alert me as soon as possible before i lose that three horse three phase you know 480 motor uh they're expensive and they're heavy <laughs> and they're not a lot of fun to change. Right. Uh, so, you know, that's just an example. That's just one example of where, where we would use that, that type setup. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, so John, you haven't talked in a while, so I'm just going right. to go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and put you on the spot. So mm -hmm. you started, you, I know, I know you're excited about this. So you started off uh, working almost primarily in residential right. and you made a transition to now where you work completely in commercial and uh, work on a lot of really big stuff, but then you also work on the control side. So mm -hmm. what are some things that you see um, electricians maybe who are making the transition? Maybe when you made the transition, you were like a little confused by stuff. What are some of the things that uh, are some of the top tips you would give or some of the things that you often see misunderstandings around? So the one thing that I never had to worry about when I was a residential guy is load balancing that I now have to worry about constantly because, you know, the whole reason that you have a three phase inside of a, you know, a commercial application is because you've got a lot of stuff and then you want to spread it out across a, a lot of things. Um, so a lot of stuff and you spread it out across a lot of things. Spread it out, spread yeah. it out across a lot of things. You're, things and stuff. You're, you're, like your deep you decided to do You decided to do a live stream after my bedtime. <laughs> It's after I, my I bedtime too. Start. I'm a lot older, so. <laughs> <laughs> so no one. That was the biggest thing is learning how to properly balance out the phases and take all of your different loads and make sure that they are spread out evenly across so that you don't have some sort of issue. Um, I had an issue recently um, in a grocery store where we had a bunch of different um, 
circuits all landed on the same phase. So you ended up having one phase that was incrementally higher than the other two phases. And it ended up uh, nearly, you know, tripping the main. And that's something that we never really had to watch out for inside of a residential application. Um, so that was that would be the one thing I would say is just pay attention to how you land the loads, um, you know, and make sure that your neutrals balanced out and that you know you're not overloading any sort of uh, any any sort of thing like that. A question from the audience. Uh, I'm going to give this one to Phil. So, what are some of the easiest, most practical ways? You're an electrician. You're a grocery tech. You're an HVAC tech. Uh, maybe you're looking inside a panel or you're looking inside of a piece of equipment. What's some of the easiest ways to identify the difference between a delta and a Y? He spelled it a delta versus a Y, W-H-Y, but either way. So if you're at the panel and you just have the wiring coming in, landing in, in your panel, you're not going to be able to tell just by looking at the wiring. You might be able to infer what the configuration is by taking some voltage readings. Um, if you read um, to you're going to read 120 volts to ground, um, whether you have delta or Y, but if you're going to find that stinger leg or that high leg when you read um, from B face to ground, if it's wired per code. So that if you read, if you find that high leg right away, it's delta. And if you don't find it, then more than likely you're you're not. Well, you might be corner grounded, uh, but you might not have a neutral, but. So, but generally you're not going to care anyway, but is there yeah, like any, is yeah. there any like obvious like color coding or anything else? Oh, that yes. Gonna, that well, that would be make? obvious. Good point. Yeah. Um, now this, this really is reliant on people following codes. Um, but the, the B phase, um, and your three phase system when it's a highlight is supposed to be identified as orange. Another way you might be able to tell is if it's a Delta system is when you're, you're looking at your breakers and you have a bunch of single pole breakers lined up and every third space is empty. That'll tell you, you know, to say, Oh, we might have a high leg here. Cause otherwise, why aren't they just continuing in sequence? Um, and you're not going to see that with a Y configuration. Um, and of course, if you have 480 volts coming into your building, you're going to have step down transformers on premises um, and checking out the name tags if they're available. They're going to have a configuration of the transformer type on the, on the front of it. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Um, I wanted to bring this up again um, because when we were talking about the, uh, the test across contact points, um, this is just a really good one. I mean, two of the really good things that have been brought up are the use of an infrared camera is really handy for a lot of the problems that you're going to find. Um, and it matters more in three phase for the reasons that we mentioned. Single phasing, phase imbalance matters more. Uh, motors running hot, poor connections, all that kind of stuff. But just this idea of anytime you have a question about a connection or a contact point or even across a breaker or whatever, you can all uh, energized and operational. So it has to be energized whatever device it is has to be under load test. You actually measure across it and you're looking for a voltage drop. Um, and that in Matthew, it's the first time I've ever heard that half a volt being kind of the standard, but really you can, this is where like one of those things are not like the other. If you go across the other legs uh, or across other de devices and it's next to nothing. Uh, and this one is 0.3 or 0.5. Uh, and then you grab out your, th your thermal imager or your uh, infrared thermometer. And you're like, yeah, this sucker's hot. Um, now you've got an indication that you have a problem, but really taking that seriously in three phase. And then also, like we mentioned before, um, looking carefully at phase monitoring, making sure that um, uh, that you have some sort of phase monitoring in place with any sort of mission critical components. I mean, I used to put phase monitors, I used to work on a lot of banks and we would do rooftop units um, in sort of what, just basic Y configured three phase. And they wouldn't come with any sort of phase monitoring from the factory. We would always install that. Uh, I don't remember the model number anymore, but that black ICM with the push buttons on it. I don't, I, I don't remember which, what, what it's called anymore, but um, but we would always install those. Uh, and a lot of times it would prevent uh, significant failure from single phasing uh, or from voltage imbalance. But it also has the advantage of also just doing because you know, sometimes st that stuff comes from a utility. It, it isn't necessarily even. Uh, the fault of uh, of the electrical system inside the building. A lot of times, the utility will drop a leg, or you'll get um, a, a imbalance, voltage imbalance, straight from the utility. And that's another advantage of phase monitoring. Something you cannot uh, you cannot prevent. Uh, and Winstagram says the ICM four hundred and fifty. Thank you, thank you, Winstagram. I appreciate that. So, uh, all right, Brian, so if you don't 
don't mind. I'd like right. to clarify just for a minute. That half volt we were talking about, uh, that is really specific to the voltages you're using and what type of equipment you're running there. Correct. I threw that number out there as kind of a standard for the refrigeration world with 483 phase power, uh, you know, driving compressors. If you're running something else, <laughs> that, that, that tolerance may may be too, too big of a gap, right? Uh, you know, that's those compressors handle half a volt with no problem. Uh, VFDs get a little more sensitive about it. Uh, there's not normally a contactor involved when we have a VFD. We're feeding right. the power to the VFD all the time, but it's possible uh, that we do uh, for other reasons, you know, not to turn that on and off, but to lock it out. For instance, if we're running two pieces of equipment, we may lock it out that way. Um, that's going to be far more sensitive to that, uh, to that half volt. So we're going to, we're going to have, instead of, you know, those, well, I can walk into a part store and buy it type contactors. We're probably going to have something with some silver contacts, you know, trying to keep the, that voltage really, really low. So just to be, just to clarify that, you know, that half volts is a good, rough, practical HVAC refrigeration guy number, you know, for what That's we a tight do. tolerance. But if you're, if you're doing something else, uh, you know, that, that, that number, number may need to be tighter. Uh, that's the first thing. The second, I want to talk about, we keep talking about phase monitors and you just mentioned what it is. When when we have a phase monitor, what we're doing is we're monitoring all three phases of power. There's going to be a couple dials on that or, or you know, as, as the one you described, I can program some settings in there on what I'm looking for, what's acceptable, right? So it's going to compare those three phases and see that those voltages are very, very similar. It's not measuring amps. It's, mo it's measuring the volts coming into the building. Uh, and we're going to compare that to that parameter that I said is okay. You know, so if I've got one at 460 and I've got another one at, at 510, I want to set that so, so it sees that and says that's I'm too far out of, out of balance. The other thing it's going to do is it's going to look for a complete loss or a partial loss on just one of those legs and, and say, hey, I've got a problem here. Some of them were expensive ones. We haven't even talked about uh, phasing as far as rotation goes. Some of them can detect if I've connected uh, if I if I've reversed the order you know, on a pair, and I may run things backwards. Uh, so uh, some some most don't, but some can. And and then what we're going to do with that when we're testing that and we're measuring all that, we're going to run our control circuit somehow through that device. That device is going to act like a relay. It's just going to open or close a set of contacts. If the power is coming in, it's going to change. It's going to energize that relay. So it's going to change my normally closed to open, my normally open to closed. So I've got to run some type of safety device through that circuit to shut off the equipment that I'm trying to protect or, or tell my building, inner, my management system, hey, I've got a phase loss, shut down everything, right? That's another thing we might do uh, is with that contact, just send a signal, uh, you know, turn off all my air conditioning. Uh, I don't have three phases of good power anymore. So when we're talking about phase monitoring, there's lots of different models. There's lots of different yeah. ways to do it, but that's what they're doing. For sure. And one of the things that we literally almost got through this entire live stream and now in the last 10 minutes we're going to talk about the thing that people want to know most <laughs> in our trade which is this question about uh about phase direction and uh, or, or motor uh the directions that motors spin uh, depending on the phase sequencing uh so first thing we want to answer eli's question which is that the high leg has nothing to do with this i mean other than the fact that it is the b phase um but but phil i want to first kind of get your perspective an electrician's perspective on what is your responsibility in order to ensure that everything is landed appropriately so that motors run the right direction when equipment goes on? Like, what do you do to try to help ensure that that's correct? Um, well, usually you know, most of us aren't carrying around phase rotation meters. Um, and so we're, we're keeping track of our color coding as, as we wire the building. Um, and so long as we do that, we can, with a pretty high percentage of success, say that black is a phase red is b phase blue is c phase and if i put the l1 l2 l3 if i land it that way in the equipment it should run the right direction um and oftentimes by by the time the equipment actually gets started up in testing we're we the wiremen aren't even there um and it's usually the hvac guys telling you know complaining about how bad we are and we don't pay attention to phase <laughs> rotation and all this and we're like what do we know we don't we just landed wires in, in two places. Um, 
So I like the term wireman. <laughs> we didn't sweep up when we were done anyway, yeah. but that's the yeah, cleaner's yeah. job, you know, like whatever. Um, what yeah, I know? mean, you could go the extra mile and, you know, be there with the, with the HVAC techs when you do the startup. Um, if maybe if depending on the time of the project, have a rotation meter. They're not expensive. And just, okay, A, B, C phase, I'm, I have the correct rotation. Um, and then after that, it's like we're, we aren't usually the ones who can start the equipment ourselves. It's usually the HVC techs or the refrigeration techs. And then typically the phase reversal is happening by them. Um, but maybe that's not the case. If you, and, and you want to know how to do that, what you can do if it's just a, a dumb contactor pulling in and out, you can reverse the leads at the contactor. It's usually the easiest place to do it is to reverse it at the contactor. Um, at the point closest to the load is what I prefer. Um, and it's just easier than changing it inside the motor itself. However, I ran into this where I tried to, I didn't know better yet. I tried to do phase reversal on it with a VFD in the system and I swapped it on the line side. And no matter what I did, I couldn't get the, the thing to fit, to change rotation because because it, it was would, still making its power inside its little brain and ignoring right. your voltage. It was actually coming in just like we were talking about a minute ago. Right. Yeah. So with the FDs, either if it's programmable to change reverse, like sometimes Make I think it. maybe they are yeah. or just, you know, reverse it on the load side. Yeah. And that's actually so. So we had a couple cases. So um, simple answer. If you have a motor that's running backwards, you switch any two legs and it fixes it. Right. OK, there's the simple answer, but it isn't always that simple. Um, and also, that's not something you do haphazardly um, because we had a case where uh, somebody started up a unit. And again, they shouldn't have done this. Um, but it was somebody they were just they were doing a roof sweep. And so they're just going through firing them off. OK, yeah, blowers run in the right direction. Yep, blowers run in the right direction. Yep, blowers run in the right direction. Right. And uh, they didn't realize the blowers were on a VFD. So that was phase correcting. Uh, it was rotation correcting. But the compressors, by the time they kicked on, they were running backwards and they just let them run for a long time until they failed. Um, and so that's where you really have to pay attention. There's a VFD involved. The VFD can do what Phil said, where it could it could actually be the one causing the phase rotation problem. Then it doesn't matter what you do on the inlet side, right? Uh, or it could be correcting for the phase rotation problem. And if you have other components that aren't connected through a VFD and are connected sh straight to the power supply, they could be running backwards. So you just when you start up equipment, you have to be standing there. And you have to make sure that it's not running backwards. And some guys will be like, well, how do I know if it's running backwards? Well, we're mostly talking about scroll compressors here. That's the biggest, yeah. that's the biggest critter. And you, if you can't tell that a scroll compressor ain't running right when she fires up and she's running backwards, then as everybody always says in the Facebook groups, well, then you need to go back to school or more likely you need to get a hearing aid or something. You know, that's because it's pretty, it's usually pretty obvious that they're, uh, that they're not working and your pressures aren't changing at all. And your current's way wrong. And there's a lot of factors there. Yeah. So. I think when, you know, I haven't done motors this big before, but depending on how much torque that motor has, the, you don't want it necessarily connected to the load. I think sometimes like if you want to check that rotation of that motor before you hook, like if you're doing conveyor systems or something, sure, like that, of course, of course, you know, right. the right um, way would be to use a phase, a rotation meter, right? Yeah. Like that would be the right way to check it every single time. We just know that most of your AC techs and one of the guys in the comments said, Hey, they're cheap. Everybody should get one. I don't disagree. Uh, but we, you know, we know the realities of this situation. And so worst case scenario, just, and this is a rule that I learned, like, Dave Barefoot taught me the first time I ever did a startup on a residential condenser. He's like, you never turn on a disconnect. You never, you turn it on with you right there where you can see what happens. You know, are the wires dangling in the condenser fan? Is there something crazy happening? You always are there present when that equipment kicks on for the first time. And that's, that's just a good general rule. Whether you did phase, whether you used a phase rotation meter or not, that's just a, that's just what we need to be doing as a, as a standard practice for startup. Um, Let's see. We're coming to the end here. Let's see if there's any other question. Anybody have anything else that's burning a hole in your soul that you want to mention here on our esteemed panel? Uh, I'd, I'd like to carry that a little bit farther when we're Go talking ahead, about yeah. checking phases on the equipment. There's a couple of different reasons we'd be doing that, right? One is we're installing it. You know, we installed some new equipment. We changed a compressor. We changed a fan motor. We replaced the whole unit. So, so we're going to check that, right? But another place that, that we can have a problem that I've personally experienced we have a, a power outage. Somebody smashes a car in the power pole in front of the building. Hmm. Uh, the power company comes out and they do some work. Well, when they're done, we need to check the phase again uh, on the building. 
uh, often, uh, I say often, occasionally, uh, something goes wrong there, and we end up with two swap phases. Changing a transformer behind the building is another place that that sometimes happens. Uh, and and even worse, you know, we, down here in Florida, hurricane season, we're hooking up three phase giant, you know, multi meg generators behind the building there on an 18 wheeler platform. Right. Yeah, we could definitely mess that up two or three times. Right. Because we're connecting the generator and then we're going back to the utility who thinks they're up and then they're not up anymore. And, you know, we're we're back and forth on this every single time we've got to check phase. And, and Brian, you called out a really great point there. The older guys, I can tell you, are looking at that fan mode or the supply fan. That's how they do it, right? They they turn on one unit, go up on, on the roof and open the door. Uh, today, you know, most 10 ton and larger commercial units are going to have some kind of VFD driving that. And it, it's not going to change, even if it's backwards, just what you just said. Uh, and then the third is, you know, this these compressors sitting behind me, these semi-hermetics, uh, you know, how do you check phase on those? You don't, they can run backwards. It's fine. <laughs> right? It's, we might get a little hum if, if uh, you know, a little vibration, if they're not, if they just sync up wrong, you know, yeah. uh, but they'll, they'll run either direction. So some, some equipment can run both ways, uh, you know, fans, as we know, cannot and either controls. That's one of my favorite um, uh, jokes to do with new guys when, because when we're teaching about scrolls and rotational direction and how important that is. And I'm like, and with the recip, it's a real problem too because if they if they run the right way, they go like this, and if they run the wrong way, they go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, That's I didn't see a difference. I'm like, well, you didn't catch it. Okay, let me show you again. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm literally right, I'm that borrow, guy I'm now. I'm gonna borrow that one. I'm, yeah, I'm officially that guy now. I never thought I would be that guy. And then you wake up one morning and you're that old guy who just likes to harass. How did I get you? You've been that guy since I've known you. I'm pretty sure right. you're aware of it. <laughs> That's yeah, easy, easy. All right. Fair enough. Uh, anyone else have anything that uh, needs to be covered here as we wrap up? I don't think we have any comments that are, uh, that are really that pressing. Uh, it's a really good conversation. Very uh, information dense. Uh, we covered a lot of content here. Uh, we're going to have a tech tip. Uh, Emily will eventually put up a, a tech tip that uh, kind of covers everything we discussed in a much more organized way. She always takes our mess <laughs> and she makes it like we actually know what we're talking about, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's it's just really important, uh, first of all, to not be afraid of it. It really isn't that complicated. It isn't that hard to understand, but it's usually the practical things that will get you. And the stuff we've covered here, I think will be a good place to just kind of get you started. And as always, dig deeper. Um, the, your particular equipment's going to be different. There's going to be uh, changes. Read your read your manuals, RTFM. Read your, read the fantastic manual, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Adam or Matt, you guys haven't said a thing this entire time. So anything <laughs> anything you wanna you wanna add to uh, wrap us up here? I'm just taking it all in, you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I definitely have enjoyed just listening to everybody. I, I feel like I've learned a ton. Uh, which is super fun. And, and yeah, I think, I think, uh, Brian, to your point, like maybe a, as a mostly residential guy, like I don't understand all of this, but at least I know when I go to, if I do a commercial job, like, you know, I need to have my ears up a little right. bit when I'm, when I'm looking around and, you know, just kind of remember that things are different and, and remember, okay, yeah, yeah. There's something about phase rotation. I need to make sure that I double check that. Right. And then you can pull up your phone and, you know, do some research right there while you're, while you're looking at it, just as long as you kind of have that, uh, bookmark in the back of your head right. when you go somewhere and do something different. That to me is kind of one of the most helpful things. Yeah. Which is what I always say for people who are like, I didn't understand any of this. It's like, right. You, you, you don't learn how to do anything on a podcast or a live stream. Like not really. <laughs> Uh, but but you can get uh, you can be uh, exposed to some new ideas that then when it comes up and you start like, oh, OK, uh, well, this is like this. Then all of a sudden it'll start to make sense and it'll start to click. Uh, and that's OK. Right. So we're not we're not we're, you know, we're not here telling you how to how to do this job on the Internet. That's not realistic. But <laughs> um, but at least kind of having some things you're like, oh, yeah, now I remember yeah, VFDs. That can be something that I got to think about here. Um, or man, I'm running into the, all this, I'm running into all this motor failure. Why did that maybe happen? And you can start to kind of go back to the list and hopefully it'll, it'll help you, uh, save some, save some pain and suffering. Uh, anyway, guys, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to do this out of your evenings. It's always very appreciated, not expected, but always appreciated. It's kind of like tips, um, tip your waitresses, everybody out there. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thanks guys. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. See you. Thanks.